Okay, folks, so we will begin. Thank you very much. Welcome uh, and thank you for joining us for today's Tea Time Talk, Solving the Tenements, Dublin Corporation and the Housing Question, 1880 to 1940. Uh, if you haven't been here before, and I suspect many of you uh, are regulars at these talks, but if you're not, Tea Time Talks is a series of talks we run uh, inspired by the history and people of 14 Henrietta Street in Dublin 1. 14 Henrietta Street is a social history museum of Dublin life, uh, not just the tenement story, but how one building can tell us the story of Dublin from its Georgian beginnings to its kind of subdivided tenement times. Uh, it's run by Dublin City Council uh, Culture Company, and we run cultural initiatives at buildings across the city with and for the people uh, of Dublin. So Tea Time Talks with 14 Henrietta Street. Uh, and Mondays at the Mess with Richmond Barracks. My name is Donald Fallon, and in a few minutes, I'm gonna hand you over to today's speaker. But before we start, I want to let you know there will be time at the end of this for some questions. So if you have a question, uh, pop it in the Q&A box, the chat box down there, and I will put as many of them as we can uh, in the time we have to root at the end. Our speaker today is Dr. Ruth. New books on the shelves, I have one of them here with me, which you'll learn about today. Uh, Ruth is very busy. She's also the Associate Professor in Geography at the School of History and Geography in Dublin City University. So this book, uh, which is a second edition of a very, very important book, is Dublin 1910 to 1940, Shaping the City uh, and Suburbs. She's also the co-author of Building Healthy Homes, Dublin Corporation's First Housing Schemes, 1880 to 1925, with the very busy, also very busy, uh, Joseph Brady. And we were joking the other day about how my, my great granny actually lived uh, in one of those very first blocks on Ben Borb Street. She's the editor and an editor of the Irish Historic Towns Atlas series and a member of the International Commission on the History of Towns. And I suppose she's primarily interested in the nature of the urban and suburban, and that's what we're talking about today, I suppose, Dublin beyond the canals, the urban and suburban landscape. Much of our work focuses on the physical and social development of everyday spaces. So this is a talk I'm really, really looking forward to. And if you have questions, as I say, give them to us in the chat box. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn off my mic and camera and hand you over to Ruth. Thanks so much, Donald. Um... And uh, thanks to everybody who's giving up their uh, time this evening to listen to me. Um, I'm delighted to be here, uh, even though I'm speaking to this disembodied audience. Um, so the title of my talk is Solving the Tenements, but the question mark is very important. So I suppose our question for tonight is, to what extent did Dublin Corporation actually manage to uh, solve this uh, huge problem. And um, I'm, we don't have a lot of time, so it will be a bit of a whistle stop tour. I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, and really looking at the early efforts of Dublin Corporation to address a huge housing problem in the city, not just a problem of poor housing, but also poor public health. Um, so we'll start off looking at the, the causes because you need to understand what the problem is uh, that will determine your solution. Uh, what they started to do first, uh, we have this very important housing inquiry in 1913, which gives us a sense of um, the state of play and also uh, directs uh, the movement towards new solutions. And then we'll, we'll talk about what happened in the 20s when we start to move out into the suburbs and then the 1930s with return to slum clearance. So it's quite an ambitious program. And as Donal mentioned, I'll be drawing um, extensively on these two recent publications. So to begin with, um, what was the tenement problem? And I suppose um, it's important to realize that tenements existed in Dublin for a very long time. So this James Whitelaw publication mentioned there on the left is as early as 1798. So he did a survey of uh, Dublin's population and he uh, found that there were quite a lot of tenements already in the city. So subdivided houses. Um, Dublin had a, a number of problems uh, and a crisis in housing grew over the course of the 19th century. So there's a combination of forces at work 
One is the fact that the city didn't really industrialize. I have a picture here of the famous Jacob's Biscuit Factory, but of course, although Dublin was known for brewing, distilling, food processing, there wasn't really a demand for a skilled uh, labor force or an industrial labor force. There were a lot of people in the city who didn't really have access to uh, steady employment and to well-paid employment. Um, and that became even more problematic over the course of the century for a number of reasons. Of course, famously, we lost our Dublin-based parliament after the Act of Union in 1801. And that stripped away the upper echelons of society who stopped spending time in, in Dublin in grand houses like 14 Henrietta Street, as it had been. Um, and they abandoned their city homes and, and started to uh, reside more of the time in London, close to Parliament. Um, and that meant that um, those grand homes that we see, for example, in Malton's Prince uh, are no longer useful for those people. And uh, they become, uh, over time, uh, used in different ways, some for commercial purposes and others being subdivided into multiple family homes, which were famously described as the most architectural slums in Europe. Uh, so we have a problem of overcrowding in the city. We have this system of subdivision um, and that's problematic because houses which are designed for single families um, aren't always uh, sanitary uh, when uh, many families are occupying them. So there were problems around refuse disposal, there were problems around landlords. Um, and one of the biggest problems in the 19th century was the sort of the laissez-faire approach. So this idea of non-intervention, which limited reform, limited legislation to deal with these problems. So there were lots and lots of issues already. So housing is part of a bigger problem, a problem about um, poverty, um, a problem where we have an influx, a constant influx of population from the countryside into Dublin, as well as a very high birth rate. So there's a huge demand for housing, but uh, it's not um, financially viable for private developers to go building new housing uh, because these people can't afford to pay uh, decent rents. So we have this large workforce relying on insecure and irregular employment deep rooted poverty and the tenements become a focus of all of this. Um, so the tenements existed for, as I said, at the start of the 19th century, but because the property market uh, changed over the course of the century, uh, it made it easier for people to buy these properties and subdivide them. And the people who divided these houses and left them to poorer tenants were described as house jobbers. And as early as 1845, we have Thomas Willis describing these people in a very negative way, saying how they have no interest in the houses. All they're interested in is making money out of them. So there's no repairs being undertaken. There's no cleansing. The yards at the back are a really big problem. And the mention here, I don't know if you can see it, if a necessary be in any of them. So if there were toilet accommodation, so there would have been maybe a dry closet out the back, um, that was also a problem. Uh, so, so there were very serious problems, even by mid-century, that continued to grow. So the, the peak of the tenement problem really doesn't arise until into the 20th century. So this is a long-standing and continuing problem uh, linked to the economic problems of the city. So even in the best of parts of the city, uh, there were problems of squalor. Um, so the parish priest of St. Andrews there in Weston Grove, it was one of the wealthiest parishes of the city and he describes how you have families in tiny rooms um, and some of them have, have nothing, they don't have any bedclothes, they're, they're, they're sleeping on the, the rags that they wear during the day, it's just absolutely horrific conditions, very close to very uh, wealthy areas, so Merrion Square and its fine houses and then just in behind it, I'm not sure how well you can see um, all of these tiny little lanes, back alleys, courts, um, where we have uh, many impoverished families. 
Now, tenements has been used in Dublin, I suppose, as a bit of a catch-all term, because it wasn't just the houses of the rich which had been subdivided and reused. And that's sort of technically what we would call a tenement in Dublin, which is, of course, different to a Scottish tenement, for example, which is a purpose-built uh, uh, building. Um, but anyway, we don't just have tenements themselves. We also see um, a lot of smaller units, which were uh, cottages or cabins, um, filling in the, the former back gardens, um, these so-called co courts and alleys. Some of these are converted stables, because of course, what you would have had originally were the wealthy living in, in the front house, and they would have had a, a, a back access, a back lane leading to mews and stables. And because the people in the front houses are, were no longer the kind of people who needed stables, um, you now had uh, those uh, stables and mews buildings uh, being reused uh, for uh, accommodation. The worst of all, of course, were the cellar dwellings. And there was constant efforts to close these down. People were paying a weekly rent. They had no security of tenure and people moved a lot. Um, so even if you're trying to trace people, say we did a project tracing people in Buckingham Street between 1901 and 1911 and you know, very uh, significant movements of population occurring. Um, and of course, one of the biggest problems was um, the uh, toilet accommodation. Uh, given the number of people uh, relative to the number of uh, closets or privies, um, that was a real uh, source of infection and disease. Um, so sanitation was uh, an ongoing problem. And it was very difficult to enforce regulations even where they existed. Because if you came in and, and your sanitary officers closed down cellars or, you know, um, in sanitary accommodation. They had powers to do that from about the 1860s on. Um, where were those people going to go? There was such a shortage of accommodations. So they were only going to go and become uh, part of an overcrowded situation somewhere else, or even they'd come back in, they'd break back in and they'd occupy uh, those dwellings again. Um, this is a map that my colleague Jacintha Pronti uh, has produced. Um, it's a complex map, but it shows the situation in the middle of the 19th century. All I want you to see is all of those black lines represent locations where um, more than two thirds of uh, the dwellings uh, or the buildings on the street are tenements. So what you can see is that almost every part of the city has tenements. So it's not just one part of the city. And that is something that marks Dublin out as different. There were tenements in London, for example, but what's different in Dublin is how widespread they are. Only really the area there uh, in the southeastern uh, quadrant, if you like, of the city, uh, around St. Stephen's Green there, Marion Square, that has, uh, that's sort of relatively immune, not entirely immune, but it's not as bad. Um, so that's just a shot. These are some photographs from 1913, uh, but they give you an idea. So this is in the back of the main houses. Um, you can see again here we have again 1913 photographs and these are some of the back lanes and the courts. So you can see the lack of air even the problems in accessing these uh, locations, uh, these yards, back alleys and so on. So lo lots of people crammed into overcrowded conditions. You can see how difficult it would be to get in and to, to clean out, say, dung heaps and so on. So it's a breeding ground for disease. And of course, this is one of the things that uh, the corporation, the city government, becomes very aware of, this fact that the tenement houses seem to be linked to the really high death rates in the city. And it's really that that's a starting point in terms of trying to address housing in the city. It's the public health angle. So these are some stats from 1879, a Royal Commission, which show that there were nearly 10,000 tenement houses across the city. And that is referring to the area inside the canals and the circular roads. So the area that was governed by Dublin Corporation. Um, so nearly 120,000 people, 47% um, of the city's population living in tenements. So it was a very, very extensive 
problem, as you can see. So the death rate was linked to tenements, but it was also linked to poverty. So the question is, even if you were able to get rid of the tenements, would you actually manage to solve the problem? Was the problem the housing? Not entirely. It was also the problem of poverty. It was lack of opportunity. It was lack of alternative employment prospects. But the fact that so many people were living in single rooms was, again, a source of particular concern um, because that really uh, accentuated the possibilities for disease to spread. And diseases like tuberculosis were rife in the tenements. Now, not all of Dublin was impoverished, and this is another part of the story, and this is another part of, of the corporation's problem, because people like these well-dressed ladies increasingly, and their middle-class counterparts, were no longer living in the city proper. So what happened was the city boundaries hadn't extended. Uh, they, the, so the area governed by the corporation was confined within the canals. And outside of that, what we had were independently governed suburban areas. Suburbs became increasingly pop popular over the course of the 20th century. Or sorry, the 19th century, rather, excuse me. So over the course of the 19th century, it became fashionable for people to move out of city areas, away from the overcrowding, away from the ill health, and uh, to move out uh, to uh, suburban areas. And in Dublin, uh, the suburbs were independently controlled. So if you moved out to, say, Sandy Mount um, or Black Rock, or Kingstown, now Dunleary, or Rathmines, or Drumcondra, or Clontarf, although you were very close to the city, you were no longer pay paying your local taxes, your rates, to the city's corporation. You were actually pay paying it to an independent uh, township commission. So these areas are independently governed. They're not paying their local taxation to the, to the city. And that means that Dublin Corporation has lost a big chunk of income. So they need to provide for their citizens, and yet the people who can really afford to help them to do that are no longer paying uh, taxation within the city. So this geographical shift, whereby you have an increasing concentration of poverty in the city itself, and this move uh, by the middle classes uh, outside to these suburbs, is a real problem for the corporation. And it's one that continues for a long time because although some of the suburbs are absorbed into the city in 1900, uh, the two biggest, uh, so that was uh, Pembroke, which is the Balls Bridge area, and Rathmines, they stay out right through until 1930. They're still independent and they're still doing their own thing, which causes all sorts of other complications as well, which we can't go into tonight. So that's the problem or part of the problem, at least. So how do we go about addressing it? So what did Dublin Corporation try to do? Dublin Corporation starts thinking about and talking about building quite early, but for various re reasons to do with legislation, it's not possible to do anything really until the 1880s. And the first two schemes that are built, and I'll show you some pictures in a moment, are trying to tackle the problem that people have very limited means. So the people who need housing don't have a lot of money. So the corporation cannot afford to build high quality housing and subsidize the rents uh, because it doesn't have the legislative basis to do that and it doesn't have a guarantee its ratepayers are not going to be very happy so the councillors have to have to consider the fact that if they uh, go for a very expensive housing scheme that needs to be paid for out of local taxation so it means raising local taxes which will make them extremely unpopular and the local taxes the rates in Dublin were already quite high so the solution for the corporation is to build basic accommodation, which will have low rents, but that's offset. The only way you can achieve that is that if the, the accommodation is very basic and the standards are quite low. But the first two schemes at Ben Burb Street and at Bow Lane were both very much focused on housing the needy. 
and the corporation was severely criticized. So they changed their policy after those. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So here's the very first housing scheme, part of the surviving uh, part um, of the very first housing scheme. It's very close to what's now Collins Barracks. Uh, it was known as Barrack Street originally, but uh, was renamed Ben Burb Street. And what we have is a number of four story flat blocks or tenement blocks, they were actually called. So there were 144 units. There were about five shops at the ground floor. And uh, there were a small number of three roomed flats, but most of the flats had either one or two rooms. And um, they also had a lodging house for men and a very small lodging house for women, um, most of whom were probably. Um, ladies of the night or had been ladies of the night because of course this was a red light area originally. The rents were very low from one and sixpence. So that was kind of what people would have been paying in the tenements. So it made it affordable. Um, but the problem with Barrack Street is you now have a concentration of people who don't have a lot of uh, rent um, of, of income, who uh, are quite poverty stricken, who don't have a good diet. And so the death rates in the scheme were actually higher than city average. And this was used um, to point the finger at the corporation and say, look what you're doing, you're just creating new slums. It was almost inevitable that the death rate would be high because the population living there uh, was excuse me, um, a very uh, impoverished population. But that's, again, uh, not always uh, part of the narrative. The second scheme at Bow Lane West uh, was, these are actually flats, they were demolished. Uh, they weren't very successful at all. So if you go in the front door here, you have a flat on either side and two upstairs as well. <clears throat> so uh, there's a number of units here even though it looks, it might look at first glance like a house. Uh, again, uh, this was deliberately targeted at people who couldn't afford high rents. And uh, they actually surveyed the ten tenants to find out. We don't actually have a lot of information about who tenants were typically, but here we know uh, some of the occupations of people and I've listed them there. So the char women, there was a show shoemaker, there were Dray men and van men and so on. Uh, but the downside of keeping everything as cheap as possible is that this turned out to be a very poor scheme. So uh, the corporation itself conceded by the 1920s that this was badly designed. Uh, the materials were poor. It had very bad drainage. I, you can probably see even in the photograph, this was made up ground um, very close to uh, a watercourse. So the whole thing started to subside. Um, so it wasn't the best. So after those first two schemes, the corporation sort of shifts direction a little bit and it builds to a higher standard, but it means that they have to charge higher rents. If you charge higher rents, the people who are most in need aren't going to be able to afford to live in these schemes. So this is Bride's Alley, uh, very close to Christchurch Cathedral on Patrick Street. The next scheme is Black Hall Place around about the same time. And what's interesting here is that they built a mixture of houses as well as flats. These schemes took an enormous amount of energy. Each one of these required a huge amount of uh, work in relation to acquiring sites, uh, putting forward plans, um, getting uh, loans and so on. So even though a relatively small number of units might have been provided, the same costs in terms of time and money nearly were incurred in the actual development process. Um, so that's what most of Black Hall Place has been very radically um, altered. But this is some of what survives. There would have originally been uh, shops here at ground level um, and a sort of a flat above. But you can see they're starting to look more house-like compared to the earlier block dwellings that we saw. And uh, this is a lovely little scheme of St. Joseph's Place. 
Um, so it's again, it's in behind Dorset Street and we can see lots of small little cottages, very closely packed, very densely packed and uh, not a lot of open space here. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, quite attractive and quite successful. People liked living in these uh, dwellings. So by the turn of the century, the corporation had already succeeded in completing a number of schemes. You can see quite a variety of schemes. Uh, with mixed success, I think you could say, and a relatively small number of units all told, a couple of hundred units. Given what we know about the scale of the problem, this was really a drop in the ocean. It's only a third of the, the, of, of the population living in one room tenements. Um, so you've managed to provide a couple of hundred uh, dwellings. It's, it's really not very much. And of course, there is this problem it's costing money to acquire sites and to develop them and then if you're building more, particularly the one room flats was a problem because you're creating slums for the future that was the criticism that was leveled at the corporation this is a rare scheme so in 1905 after uh, Drum, uh, Drumcondra and Clontarf had been incorporated into uh, the city um, the, uh, there was a sort of a legacy scheme that the, the, the previous township had planned uh, at a place called Mooney's Lane, just at the back of the tram depot, what's now the bus, uh, the bus station, the bus depot in uh, Clontarf. Um, but what you can see is that what they built was just the same as if it was in the city centre, even though there's lots of open space, um, they just built uh, very uh, densely uh, there. However, although we could cr criticise it, this was considered to be a great advance because it was felt that you were building in uh, a place that would have fresh air and that would help uh, to uh, stop the spread of disease. So the idea of, of Fresh air, the idea of the suburb is already taking hold as something that's quite attractive. Meanwhile, uh, the corporation is continuing now to build these what it calls cottages, these two story uh, dwellings, um, which have basically three rooms. Um, two bedrooms upstairs and a living room and a scullery downstairs. So these are examples from Cook Street and then in Hall Street, which if I swapped the photographs around, I wouldn't be able to tell which was which. Um, they also built uh, a bigger scheme at in Shakur. It was called the Oblate Site. And I love this photograph. The little kids are there in the corner peeping around. Um, this is just shortly after it's completed. Um, and again, you can see sturdy two story buildings, uh, but there is very little in the way of gardens or open space. Although this was quite a large, as I said, a large site where you could have an opportunity to do something different. Now, moving on, that was the early, the early efforts of the corporation. This is a big moment for the story because in 1913, two tenement houses collapsed on Church Street and seven people were killed. It was a time of major unrest in the city because of the 1913 lockout. And uh, there was an, a housing inquiry called, which heard a lot of evidence, a lot of witnesses. So we get a good picture of, this, of what the state of play was in the city, but we also see calls for action. So this was something that was reported internationally. Uh, on the left, we have uh, a London newspaper. Uh, the, uh, the, the homeless children of Dublin were also being featured in Le Miroir in Paris. So this uh, got quite a lot of coverage. Um, some of the findings of the inquiry uh, were, again, very shocking. And the photographs that were taken at the time also give us a really good picture of, of the problem. So we had 20,000 families living in one room tenements. Um, and the problem again of poverty was being emphasized here by Sir Charles Cameron, who was the medical officer for the city. So people not having money um, and therefore not knowing where their next meal was going to come from. This is a slight cheat, the map, but uh, because it's slightly later, but what we can see is how widespread all of the brown areas are areas where there are derelict housing and decayed housing. Um, and all of the black marks represent tenement houses. 
Um, it was felt that the unrest in the city caused the lockout uh, might not even have happened uh, if people had better housing. So this was another argument being made to intervene in the housing situation. And of course, unfortunately for the corporation, it came out rather badly from the inquiry because uh, some members of the corporation were also found to be owners of tenement houses, including some which had been condemned. So there's a, a very controversial uh, side to it. What the corporation had achieved by the time of the inquiry was 12 schemes, uh, about 1,400, 1,500 uh, homes, a lot of one room flats, as I've mentioned, and this issue of conflict of interest. So the corporation had been working hard. It had provided a lot of houses, but relative to the scale of the problem, it wasn't enough. The inquiry found that 14,000 houses were urgently required. Uh, there were so many people living in houses that were unfit for human habitation. It was going to cost an astronomical amount of money, three and a half million pounds, and it couldn't be achieved simply by refurbishment. So the only solution was going to be to build and to build in suburbs. There wasn't enough room within the city to accommodate all the housing that was required. So now we have an agenda set out for the future, an agenda which involves suburban cottages. And because there was great interest at the time in new ideas of modern town planning, uh, it was felt that this should also be part of the new story of the city, that we should design these schemes in a different way. So the 1913 inquiry uh, report was published in February of 1914. It was very important, as I've already said, and it was felt that this should be acted upon straight away. Unfortunately, things took a rather a bad turn uh, because we have, uh, within the space of a few years, we have the city centre of Dublin being destroyed twice uh, by, uh, yes, civil unrest of various sorts. We also have a major uh, international war. Um, so the problem of the tenements really was stalled during that period, or was it? Um, ironically, uh, in attempting to get uh, men to sign up uh, for the war effort, uh, the recruitment po posters uh, talked about, uh, you know, your home is worth fighting for. And the point was made by the corporation that the men that had been sent to fight should not have to come back to tenement houses and cellar dwellings. So the argument was being made that funding should be provided by the government to help address the housing problem in Dublin. Unfortunately, it was a plea that fell largely on deaf ears. So here is some of the destruction after 1916. And of course, what happens is that huge amount of money has to go into reconstruction. However, the corporation does manage to rebuild on the Church Street site. They had already planned uh, a new scheme here before the collapse, and they eventually uh, achieved this in 1915. So during the First World War, a time when it's very difficult to get material and um, funding. Um, they also continue to build as at Ormond Market. And a very interesting scheme at what becomes Cant Fort, uh, originally planned as McCaffrey Estate. And Cant Fort is interesting because it's start of a move towards a higher standard of accommodation. Uh, there's a parlor room, for example, there's indoor toilets, there are gardens. So you can see this sort of an evolution in terms of design and layout. However, a survey in 1918 shows it's just the North City. So if the map looks strange, it's because the bottom of the map is actually the River Liffey. It just shows that we still have a long way to go. And indeed, things had only worsened since the inquiry. So there are still a huge number of people living in slums at over 20,000 in one room to tenements. And again, this issue of the spread of disease. Um, so 
The red represents schemes, housing schemes that are being planned by the corporation uh, to address this. And um, one of these is out here at Merino. We also see early plans for uh, Drumcondra. So the scale of the problem clearly demanded a different type of solution. But the problem was that after the war, a uh, huge building inflation had occurred. It was going to be extremely costly to build. And that is one of the reasons why we see a different approach being taken. So uh, first of all, we see this at Fairbrothers Fields, often known as the Tenters, uh, which again had been in uh, planning for a long time or being planned by the corporation. Um, and this is how it actually uh, ends up being designed. So quite a different layout. Uh, but one of the things they do is they decide to make these houses available for tenant purchase. So you pay a, a weekly rent, but over time you will own, you will become a homeowner. That's not necessarily purely um, ideological. Uh, part of the reason for the move to tenant purchase is simply because the cost of building these houses was so high uh, that uh, having them uh, simply as, as rental houses would uh, create a continuing burden on the rates. So it was cheaper uh, to actually sell off the houses. If you're selling off the houses, even if you're doing it at a relatively low price, um, so it might have cost seven or eight hundred pounds to build a house. You're selling it for, for less than that. But the weekly rent is quite high. So the weekly rent here is anything from 10 and 9 pence right up to 15 and 9. If you remember the very first scheme we saw, the cheapest rent was one and six pence. So these rents are way outside the league of the people who are in greatest need in the city. Merino is probably the best known of the 1920s schemes. Uh, it was intentionally built as a model scheme, and it is the biggest scheme to date. So there are nearly 1300 houses in Merino. It was intended to be different in terms of design, in terms of layout, in terms of density. So 12, in fact, 11 houses to the acre at Merino. So lots of variety in house designs, and again, built for tenant purchase. Um, again, a lot of uh, very large families applied for houses in Merino. So uh, for the very first tranche of houses, we can see uh, there were 21 families who had 12 or more people living in them. So the smallest uh, family size that was accepted in the first scheme was 160. Uh, there were 160 families with eight members. These are bigger houses, but they still only have three bedrooms. So they were Although they're built to a low density overall, within the houses there would have been quite a high density of people. There were very few flats built in the 1920s. One exception is here at Boyne Street, and these are actually duplex. So the ground floor at the front is a self-contained unit, and there's also access from the back of these stairs into what is in effect a two-story unit. Now, by now, the idea of building suburban cottages was being seen as the way forward. It was providing the best possible uh, quality in terms of air, in terms of space. Um, and there was a big backlash when these new flats were being built. They were described as inhuman packing cases. Um, and there was a lot of criticism too about the kind of surroundings uh, of the dwellings. So it wasn't just about the nature of the dwellings, the units themselves, it was also the entire environment. The fact that you were close to pubs and street corners and the children would have to play on the streets, although we all grew up playing on the streets. Um, whereas in a place like Merino, here you have a, a much better environment. Um, after Merino, um, looking carefully at the time, I don't want to spend too long, uh, 
this was seen as a model that would be replicated. So there was a similar pattern to further schemes, although none of them were ever quite as uh, significant in terms of, for example, the variety of design and so on. So Drumcondra had to pair back, it had smaller houses than Merino, for example. Um, and by the late 1920s, oops, sorry, by the late 1920s, it became apparent that tenant purchase was really uh, problematic because you weren't addressing the needs of the, the, the most impoverished. So the move was back to building rental accommodation. Um, and these were mostly suburban dwellings initially, but they were being built to a larger scale. And that in itself caused some problems and some criticism. So in the 1930s, what we see is a move to slum clearance because it's clear that um, there are still huge uh, needs out there. There's still constant influx of population. Uh, there, so you're trying to uh, solve a problem, you know, where the, the taps are still running, that the bath is still overflowing um, because there's still people coming in. Um, so uh, the corporation decides to continue to build suburban accommodation. It's now for rental and it's much more standardized, but it's also going to try and tackle the slums um, and those people who have really been neglected um, by the approach. And it's, it's tackling those by building flats close to where they live in the city center. And these are the famous Herbert Sims flats. So um, this also provided um, empl employment, of course, which was an important issue at the time. Here's Crumlin under construction. So in the clearance areas, we see um, the population being decanted from all of these little courtyards and laneways and so on, being kept in the locality. And I love this photograph because it's really the, the, the old and the new side by side. These were cheap uh, to rent. It wasn't, uh, from, an, from the corporation standpoint, it actually meant that they were losing money uh, on the flats, but they were very, very uh, attractive. And I think more recently, the architecture is uh, being celebrated indeed. But the rooms even then were recognized as being too small. And interestingly, in 1938, it was said, uh, these buildings will be out of date before they're worn out. And the corporation has been working hard to retrofit some of these developments now, knocking flats together and so on. Um, so there's a long debate and an ongoing debate about whether to build flats or cottages and where they should be. Should they be in the city centre or should they be in the suburbs? So to finish off, uh, had the corporation solved the tenements by 1940? Well, here's a photograph of some kids outside a tenement house in the 1940s. So the, the tenements certainly still existed and continue to exist for quite a long time. Um, there were still 28 and a half thousand families in tenements um, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, but what had changed was that there was an acceptance of the need to provide housing, uh, whether that be in flats or in cottages. There was a huge push to build housing first, which led to problems with lack of amenities because the houses went in before there were any other services. But private developers now had to adopt standards, good standards of housing because the quality of the a corporation housing was high. Um, the trend towards building low density suburbs had been established and continued. And also the idea that people could hope to own their own homes over time. So, um, sorry, I forgot about this slide. Um, I'm gonna skip that one. And just, I want to show you two, a couple of photographs. This is a photograph from 1913 of conditions. 50 years later, this is what most people in Dublin could hope to live in, to aspire to live in. This is a photograph from 1913 of all of the people living in one house, one tenement house. And I love this photograph, 20 years later, here we have Mrs. Walsh getting the keys uh, to her new home. So perhaps um, not everybody got what they hoped for. Um, we've seen a lot of 
of criticism of early efforts to build affordable housing, uh, the move to build more attractive and aesthetically pleasing housing at lower densities, debates around costs, debates about where and what to build, about the idea of home ownership versus rental. But we can certainly say that people were lifted out of poverty. And despite the odds against them, the corporation continued to build even during wartime, even during the revolutionary period. And if we speak to anybody who got one of these uh, corporation homes or flats, um, they had a great pride in those new homes. So I'll leave it to you to consider uh, how effective the corporation was at solving the tenement problem. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ruth, for that really, really excellent journey uh, through your research and that book that you just saw there, Dublin, 1910 to 1940, Shaping the City uh, and Suburbs, one of Ruth's two uh, new books on, on the shelves. This uh, this book has been brought back with some really nice appendixes and a, a beautiful introduction from uh, Dermot Bulger, uh, a poem in honour of, of Herbert Sims. A couple of questions came in, so I'm going to put them to root. And if anyone else has a question, uh, now would be a good time to ask it. Speak now, forever hold your peace. But I'll take as many of them uh, as, as we have time for. So Caroline asked, the high debt rates in the first schemes you mentioned are interesting. Would they have been similar to the debt rates in the tenements uh, or worse? Yeah, um, I think uh, they would have been similar. And it's really just those first two schemes which were um, deliberately aimed at the same population that would have been living in the tenements. So what we're seeing is really uh, the effect of poverty. It's not necessarily um, so much about the, the housing accommodation, but there were issues around overcrowding in those very early, um, you know, they, they built a lot of one room flats and you still have families cramming into them. So you're almost replicating the tenement conditions. And there were problems as well with sanitation in the very early schemes. So yeah, Unfortunately, um, that was a big problem and it, it made it very hard then for the corporation to argue the case uh, that it needed to build uh, housing because they were saying, oh, you're just building more slums. Patrick asks a very good question about the, the townships. Was that what, if anything, was done by the townships uh, for the working class poor? Yeah, well, I, I cheated there. That photograph of Mrs. Walsh getting her keys uh, was a cheat because that, that was a scheme that was built by Pembroke Township. But it's just such a nice photograph. I couldn't uh, miss it. By and large, uh, the townships had less of a problem because just by their nature, uh, they didn't have as much of a working class population. So they would have had quite a lot of domestic servants, for example, that were maybe living in or were, were actually coming out charwomen and so on who were coming out from the city uh, to work there. But um, in uh, the Pembroke area, uh, where they had sort of the Irish town uh, Rings End sort of part of the township would have been a sort of traditional working class area and they did provide housing for them. Rat Mines did have an effort, um, a Holly Mount scheme. Um, it was really bad and uh, got knocked down I think quite early on um, but they did make some efforts um, there was a scheme Elizabeth Street in in Drumcondra again which was a very small scheme inherited then by the corporations the corporation took over these various schemes when uh, the townships were incorporated. Theresa made the point I remember my mother paying her rent in the rent office in Ballyfermot, Ballyfire out uh, does Ruth see any parallels with today's housing crisis? I suppose I would add to that by asking, do you think each crisis has been has been unique in its own time? Yeah, and yet you kind of see history repeating itself. And what I often think is, you know, we, we try and solve one set of problems or how we understand the problem at one point in time. And sometimes we end up creating a new set of problems. So... Um, it made an awful lot of sense at the time to build low density suburbs um, to, to address issues around overcrowding and around air and space and so on. Um, but that led to a whole other problem when you see the massive sprawl in Dublin and all of the issues then around access and around uh, land use and oh, so many other things. Yeah. So, yeah, there are parallels and there are differences, I think, through time. Caroline asked, with the move out to the suburbs, what happened to the old tenement houses in, in the city centre? Well, I suppose one of them became a museum, but, but, but in general, 
Yeah, um, I I had a lot more slides that I had to cull. And um, I had some pictures of the very last tenements uh, to be demolished in the city in the 1980s. I actually remember as a kid, uh, the houses on Summer Hill coming down. Um, so um, yeah, they continued for a long time. There was That was one of the big problems that was actually even recognized and discussed by members of the housing committee. What's gonna happen in the city center? And um, the abandonment of uh, the city centre and this sort of hollowing out of the population became a huge issue. And it's really only in the 1980s when we see urban renewal policies that we see people starting to live in the city centre again. But it was a really big uh, problem. So, yes, yeah, some of the tenements managed to hang on in various guises and, you know, others simply uh, saw the wrecking ball at the end. A question from, from Emma here. Uh, it's easy to look back at the past with, with rose tinted glasses, of course. Were these houses built with more philanthropic intentions, uh, as we're told, or do you believe that much, much of them are built with the same kind of spec of stuff? I'm sorry, Donald, you, you broke up there slightly oh. on me. Um, suburban suburban Wi Fi. Um, <laughs> Emma was asking, is, is it easy to look back in the it is easy to look back in the past at rose tinted glasses? Were these houses built with more philanthropic intentions, as we we're told, or do you believe they were built with the same speculative profit making motives that we see today? Well, if we're talking about corporation schemes, um, they weren't in it to make money. They were in it not to make a loss, which was a very different thing. Um, so although um, in building healthy homes, um, we talk a little bit about the, the very first schemes where uh, the, the uh, corporation thought that they might actually manage to make some money out of this endeavor. Uh, really, basically, they, they just wanted to provide housing that wasn't going to be an ongoing cost and burden on the rates. So in that sense, there was uh, of some... I won't say it was philanthropic, but there was, yeah, they, they weren't speculators in that sense. Whereas if we look at, I didn't talk about it, the Dublin Artisans Dwellings Company mm. was a private company. Uh, so all those houses in Oxman Town that now cost an arm and leg or houses as houses a scheme in the Coombe, Plunkett Street, um, those artisans dwellings were built for profit. And um the corporation had an involvement in them in terms of clearance of sites and so on, but they were built for a profit. And uh, there was a huge problem there where uh, areas of slum housing were cleared and these new dwellings went in. The people who had been cleared had absolutely no hope of being able to afford to live in them. So you just see the problem being moved elsewhere. Uh, but but the corpo... Um, yeah, they made lots of mistakes, but I don't think you could accuse them of trying to um, profit from the housing problem. Uh, Mark asks about evictions from tenements. Uh, was there a problem with evictions from tenements? And if so, uh, where would people go? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I don't know so much about the... Um, about the tenement side of things, I guess, because um, that's not really... Um, my focus uh, so much. Um, I do, I, again, I, I didn't include it, but uh, it was quite, you know, you could buy a tenement house quite easily and they're advertised in the papers. It's, there's no shame actually attached mm -hmm. to being a tenement owner, surprising, some, perhaps surprisingly. But yeah, um, there were people who couldn't afford to pay. And, uh, you know, uh, you often hear that story about James Joyce's dad always doing these midnight flits and going, <laughs> you know, all over town. You know, you know, you could have a plaque in practically every street in Dublin if you if you put all the places yeah. that the Joyce's lived. Um, so, so there was a problem with, um, you know, it, it's all pretty precarious for uh, for the population who lived there, and perhaps in some ways also to the owners. There wasn't a lot of money in them, perhaps, you know, there wasn't so much profit. You know, you can argue they should have kept them in it, maintained them better, but there probably wasn't a lot of profit in, in uh, tenement ownership. And I know Mary Daly has looked at the levels of ownership. So you have the, the ground landlord, you have the, the head landlord, and then you have it's it's been sublet so many times down to the level of 
in co- sometimes the corner of an individual room being sublet, um, that by every by the time everybody gets a little bit of profit, you know, it's nothing left. Um, yes, it's, it's a complex situation. I'd like to see more work done on it, actually. The, the questions flew in, but time is against us. I'm going to take two of them very quickly, and I've taken them at random, I promise. It was all very democratic in my head. <laughs> two, two last questions. The process of eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Uh, I'll take this one from, from Jason. Really great talk uh, with lots of information. While people were stuck in the tenements during the 40s, 50s and 60s, were they given any assistance from Dublin Corporation with the upkeep uh, of the buildings? Yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting. Well, the corporation actually during the 40s, during the emergency, uh, because there was a huge shortage of building materials um, and they had to stall a lot of their plans. Um, one of the things they did was they, they started to refurb uh, some of the tenement buildings and they in, in they kind of knocked them together and they added new staircases and they put in sort of toilet blocks out the back and so on. So they did make some efforts um, to address uh, the situation. And, um, you know, there's also stories about uh, people kind of um, rendering their accommodation uninhabitable in the 60s so that they would uh, become entitled to a corporation uh, dwelling. But, you know, I mean, you know, there are stories. But there was a big, of course, um, problem in in uh, the early 60s in 63 there were two more sort of ironic it's 50 years on from the 1913 collapse with two collapses in 1963 which caused a bit of a uh, a flurry and panic um, and lead to the closing of a lot of tenements and and then this mad push to try and provide alternative accommodation which ultimately leads to development of Ballymun, which is another story I suppose this question, the last question we're going to take kind of ties into to, to Ballymun, which people think of as being a bit further out. Uh, David asked, regarding suburban building, was the public transport system able to get people uh, to and from work, the connection between these new suburbs and, and the city? Yeah, um, certainly it was, it was problematic for people moving out, um, found themselves in this kind of semi-rural environment and, um, you know, there weren't many shops and so on. Some of the, the, there was accusations of gouging as well for the few shops that were there, uh, charging very, you know, yeah, yeah, making the, the you know, benefiting from uh, being sole suppliers and so on. But yeah, as regards... Um, transport yeah so places like Crumlin were just you know beyond the end of the tram line when they were built first but you know at the same time they're now kind of regarded pretty much as inner suburbs so so places mm. in the 20s and 30s I, I, I talked to people who, who moved out to Marina when it was built and they used to walk I, I knew somebody you know she, she'd walk to work in Jacobs which was on the other side of town mm. and and walk you know some of them you know they'd walk at home at lunchtime people you know had bicycles yeah so, so so although uh, we do think of connectivity today, I think Dublin was a smaller scale and it was possible to, to move around that bit easier. The tram system was real, pretty extensive and reached most of these places. Yeah. Brilliant. So thanks to everyone else who asked a question that we didn't get to. It's always a sign of a good talk when there's, there's so many questions uh, at the end. I want to thank Ruth for giving the talk, uh, and for the book and for the endless work. Uh, and all of you for coming along tonight as well and for getting involved. We hope to see you at other events in the future, uh, as well as Tea Time Talks, which is focused on 14 Henrietta Street. Uh, we run other events and programmes you might be interested in. Mondays at the Mess, uh, a series of talks from Richmond Barracks that celebrate the rich stories and experiences of that local community, past and present, so north side and south side covered. Culture Club, uh, a series of host of talks and tours that introduce and encourage people to connect with the cultural institutions of Dublin and the National Neighbourhood, which is running all year round and creates ways for people to see and make culture uh, in their place and with people they know. So lots going on all the time from Culture Club to these Tea Time Talks. And we've been programming the talks for next year and some, some really nice ones uh, on, the, on the horizon in 2022. So you can find out about everything we do through the newsletter uh, on our website and our social media channels and hope we see you at more events uh, in the future. Nolakuna, Dave Galair, and we'll leave it there. Slang phone.